What do you want to achieve? Doubling the size of the R&D team, that means adding about 150. But I'm really taken by the 10 additional scientists you call Impossible Investigator Program. What will they do? Well, our scientists aren't like scientists you might meet at a typical food company. Impossible investigators really have the option to pursue anything in science. These are folks who have distinguished careers as tenured professors who can instead use all their gifts to create technology, research, and development that shows up in the hands of meat eaters and helps change the world for the better. Um, walking in the path that Pat Brown, our founder and CEO, started back in 2011. It's, it's the key to our success. It's why the Impossible Burger is so tasty, and it's critical for the mission we have. David, making another expansion as well into the Canadian retail food chain, I am curious where you are in terms of expansion into the retail versus the grocery store and the restaurants versus the grocery store. Where are you on that mix? Well, I can share that we certainly have adjusted in this current crazy environment in the global pandemic. We've met the meat eater where they're wanting to buy meat, whether that's in the grocery store or direct to consumer. You know, our grocery business has grown 100x since January from a little under 150 grocery locations to now 15,000 globally. And just this week, just today, actually, we announced 600 great grocery locations in Canada, along with 200 in Singapore and Hong Kong. And it's because that's where the meat eater goes. And 90% of the customers of Impossible Foods are self-avowed meat eaters. So our business has grown with where the meat eater likes to shop and we will continue to adjust to meet their demand. And so when we talk about this uh, R&D spending and this idea uh, of trying to sort of come up with new and creative ways to sort of uh, feed the appetite out there uh, for meat alternatives, David, there's a cost associated with that. And I remember early on in the process uh, when Impossible Foods sort of jumped on the radar of a lot of folks, there was a lot of talk about uh, the cost just to produce uh, those original burgers that you guys were doing. Um, how much of that factors in right now uh, to, uh, I guess, a long-term strategy for the company? Uh, in dealing with those costs and making sure that what you put out at the end of the day is not only affordable to people like me, but also profitable to the company? Well, it's very important that we not just deliver a great tasting burger or a great tasting piece of meat made from plants to meat eaters. It's got to be affordable. It's why we took a 15% price reduction in February, because frankly, we could. And it's uh, the source of that advantage we have is we use 96% less land, a fraction of the water. We, we don't have to ship, grow, slaughter, process animals in, frankly, working conditions that in, in this global pandemic we see are quite challenging for the incumbent industry. We believe that we will pass on to both investors as well as our customers our continued reduction in price and cost because we can and because our technology was designed from the very beginning to be affordable. David, you're a man who's worked at several international businesses, experience over at Zynga, Del Monte. You know what it is to take a brand international. And you have been doing with Impossible Foods going into Canada. You're in Singapore and Hong Kong. How are you seeing the international demand spread? How are you seeing supply chains evolve for you and demand evolve? Well, what's interesting about the category that we are in, which is meat, you know, 40%, for example, of global meat consumption is in Asia with a large portion in China. And the thing about meat eaters is they can take the very same piece of meat and in their hands, they can make it bespoke or custom to the cuisine and culture to the meal that they are seeking. And as a result, ours is a global rising tide for better meat, meat that meat eaters can enjoy, but is better for their health and is better for the environment. We designed in our supply chain the ability to partner with large global food manufacturers like OSI, which we announced a big deal with, so that we could scale faster and we didn't have to vertically integrate and build every single plant required to meet this global demand. And I think you'll see us continue to partner as we expand globally. David, follow up to me on something you just said, where you said we have the ability to cut prices. So are you profitable and willing to be less profitable in order to get market share? Or are you willing to sacrifice some profitability at this moment? Well, our focus continues to be on our mid to long-term mission. Now, we have to stand tall and deliver for 
all the investors that have gratefully, we received $1.5 billion to date from sophisticated investors, Tomasic, Viking Global, Co2. They expect us to deliver against their deal models, and we will. But the good news for Impossible Foods is we can provide a great return to investors as we steadily reduce price because scale is the only thing we need to have increasingly better cost structure. It's going to take time. We are a tiny fraction of the meat industry. But as we grow, we'll be able to create financial return and more affordability. We'll be able to do both.